In our lead story today, we travel to Colorado to the luxurious vacation town of Aspen. Although it's normally overrun by winter skiers and summer adventurers on its high slopes, Aspen is, for a few days each year, the home to America's most important national security and foreign policy conference, the Aspen Security Forum. And for a brief few moments at this year's forum, this little American mountain town was linked to an adversary nation half a world away. The moment in question came by way of US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, the country's foremost diplomat. During a one-on-one -on -one press interview, Blinken revealed that per America's most recent intelligence assessments, the nation of Iran is very, very close to building a nuclear weapon and is thought to be able to do so at any point on a schedule of not years or months, but mere weeks. Quoting Blinken here, Instead of being at least a year away from having the breakout capacity producing fissile material for a nuclear weapon, Iran is now probably one or two weeks away from doing that. And confirming a moment later, one or two weeks is probably what the realistic breakout time is. Blinken explained that Iran, as so far as the United States can tell, still has not actually produced a nuclear weapon, but that it is actively moving ahead on its nuclear program rather than holding in a sort of stall as the US may have hoped. Due to a range of factors stemming from the collapse of the 2015 joint nuclear deal between Iran and the US, according to Blinken, the West Asian nation is now inches away from a threshold that decades of diplomatic wrangling have tried to prevent. In order to understand just why this matters so much, we first got to understand what nuclear breakout capability is. Nuclear weapons are rather difficult to make. That much should probably be obvious. But the reason why they're difficult to make is because they require a whole lot of different sorts of expertise, materials, and equipment, all of which is quite sophisticated, and they've got to all be in the same place at the same time working toward the same function in a world where the nuclear powers of the globe are all quite strongly opposed to welcoming further additions to their exclusive club. But if there's anything easy about building a nuclear weapon, at least in a relative sense, it's the final step. The moment where you've already got all of the component parts and all of the stuff you need, and now you've got to physically assemble it into a bomb. Breakout capability, then, is what a nation achieves when it's accomplished all the hard parts of nuclear bomb making and just has held off on that last bit. That is to say, a nation has the nuclear fissile material like uranium or plutonium to make bomb, they've got the explosives to make it fire, they've got the physical hardware to make a warhead. But they deliberately hold off on actually assembling it for one key reason. So long as they don't actually build one, they haven't fully become a nuclear nation. By a trick of geopolitical semantics, a nation with breakout capability, also known as nuclear latency, can avoid all the harsh penalties that would probably come from joining the nuclear club. But any nation that wants to mess with them now has to treat them like a nuclear nation, because, after all, any period of rising tensions or military confrontation short of immediate total annihilation will give that nation enough time to throw together their pieces of a nuclear bomb and actually build the thing. Iran isn't the only nation regarded to have breakout nuclear capability. Nations like Japan, Brazil, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, and the disputed Republic of China or Taiwan are all thought to have a certain level of breakout capability, and Japan in particular could probably become a member of the nuclear club tomorrow. But simply having breakout potential and bearing suspicions that a nation might actually seek to use it are two very different things. Japan, for example, is compliant with basically every nuclear non-proliferation treaty on Earth and is a leading global voice on nuclear disarmament. If, say, China declared total war on Japan tomorrow, then sure, Japan would probably throw together a bomb, but that's a fairly high threshold to meet. Iran, by contrast, has long been known for flaunting international non-proliferation agreements or never signing them in the first place. So when it's Iran just a week or two away from possessing a functional warhead, the world is, perhaps fairly, a good bit more nervous. The idea that Iran might have been so close has been floating around the US intelligence apparatus for a few months. Back in February, a senior American official suggested that Iran could have already been days away from building a crude device, and by some outward indicators, the news Blinken shared in Aspen might have come from Israeli intelligence a bit earlier. On June the 16th of this year, US senior officials, including Blinken, met with Israel's national security advisor and its strategic affairs minister around the issue of Iranian nuclear proliferation. Israeli intelligence is deeply enmeshed in the Iranian nuclear program and is believed to be a primary source of much of America's intelligence on the subject, although Washington's considerable international assets have a role to play too. Although no hard evidence has emerged on the subject, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has suggested that Iran may have wanted to accelerate its nuclear program after an exchange in hostilities between Iran and Israel across much of this last April. 
Israeli intelligence, hard at work in Tehran and elsewhere, would likely have picked up such a thing. And when it comes to the potential implications of that new intelligence, Israel should, again, be the first topic of discussion. Israel has a long history of sabotage and interference operations against Iran's nuclear program, and it's of paramount importance to the nation and its current government under Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that Iran doesn't get the bomb under any circumstances. Iran's nuclear program is likely to be coalescing around a few moving parts and potentially capable of putting together not just one, but multiple warheads in short order. Disputing any of those key areas, or perhaps more than one, could stand to gain Israel valuable time in continuing to stand in the way of Iranian nuclear development. Add to that the fact that Israel and Iran are at perpetual loggerheads recently, not just because of their recent trade of attacks in April, but Iran's continual backing of several highly threatening organizations that Israel opposes. Therefore, the idea that Israel might be predisposed toward sabotage and potential violence prevent Iran from gaining greater geopolitical power should sound entirely plausible. But it's also important to emphasize that just because Iran has a breakout capability of a couple of weeks, that doesn't mean that the unveiling of an Iranian bomb or the surprise announcement of a first nuclear test detonation would be just a couple of weeks away. Although there's certainly value to testing a bomb, that would also require Iran to have officially completed a bomb. The potential backlash that could incur on a global stage isn't likely to be worth the trouble for Iran, especially when somebody between Iran's nuclear-armed allies, Russia, China, North Korea, and cordial Pakistan, is probably willing to come over, take a look at what Iran's got, and provide insight as to whether or not it would be satisfactory in a crisis. And frankly, if Iran really were inclined to build a bomb as soon as it could, then the breakout potential it seemingly had for months already would have already been acted upon. More likely than Iran conducting a nuclear detonation is the prospect that other nations will instead accelerate or weaponize their own nuclear programs to either build a bomb to ward off Iran or develop a similar breakout capability to match it. Israel, of course, is widely understood to be past this threshold. The country has never acknowledged its nuclear stockpile, but it's believed to have around 90 warheads available if need be. Instead, the likeliest next nation to try and acquire the bomb, if Iran does, is Saudi Arabia. Alongside the Israelis and the Iranians, the Saudis are the other major Middle Eastern powerhouse, and although it's made some progress toward building better relations with both longtime adversaries, an Iranian bomb is likely a bridge too far. Between itself, Israel, and Iran, the House of al-Saud is unlikely to be content as the only non-nuclear power, something that Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has made no bones about. Said MBS in a September interview with American Fox News, as if Iran builds a nuclear weapon, quote, we will have to get one. And if the Saudis become a nuclear arms nation, that too sets off another cascade. Any weapon the Saudis have, the United Arab Emirates will want to match, and they've already got a civil nuclear program of their own. Turkey, too, will feel pressure to join the club, raising the specter of new NATO member states with nuclear arsenals. And if Turkey crosses that threshold, then its longtime adversary Greece and its fellow autocracy curious NATO member Hungary might seek to join the conversation. Nuclear talk could spread outward to Azerbaijan, thus rolling in. Armenia, or it could spread to close Iran allies like Syria, and the cascade continues. It is a worst case scenario, absolutely, but it's worth strongly emphasizing that a nuclear Iran risks upsetting a very delicate global balance. Nine nations possess nuclear weapons today, but if that worst case scenario we've laid out comes to pass, that could raise the number to 18. And we didn't even play out the ripple effects all the way. Elsewhere in Iran's foreign affairs, the recent move to break out nuclear status comes at a moment when optimism around Iran's new president, Masoud Pezhezhkian, had already started to fade. Pezhezhkian is, at least on a scale tailored to Iran, a political moderate, and his election to Iran's presidency is something we've covered in another recent installment of the Situation Room. Pezhezhkian, then, as now, does introduce some interesting possibilities for Iran to embark on reforms. But if Western nations were hoping for a signals towards full reconciliation, they've been sorely disappointed. Now, Iran's shortened breakout time is yet another thing Pezhezhkian will likely be either unwilling or politically unable to litigate with the West. If we assume that everyone involved here has buckets of unorthodox political savvy, then sure, there's a world in which Iran presents this breakout capacity in order to invite Western attempts at reconciliation and drawdown. But to call that unlikely, well, that would be a major understatement. And finally, there's one exceptionally important question that we have to conclude this section with. If we operate under the assumption, which for now we will, that Iran intends to maintain breakout capability instead of building a bomb outright, 
Then what could tip the scales? Where is Iran's threshold to go from menacing the world with the threat of an imminent nuclear weapon to actually putting one together? Is it something that Iran might treat as a sacred last step, shattering glass around its own red button only when major war seems inevitable? Or is it a bridge that Ayatollah Khamenei could cross impulsively the next time Israel, America, or somebody else deals Iran am I in a slight? Sure, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. But where in the middle? It's a question for which we simply don't have the answer. Yet with every day that goes by, after Iran secured its breakout capability, comes another opportunity for Iran to carry out a nuclear test and declare its weapon to the world. Every day that doesn't happen is a day when it will get more and more important for the world to figure out what will make Iran cross that threshold. No nation on Earth has ever intentionally dared a nuclear power to push past its nuclear threshold. And like it or not, Iran is likely to begin receiving that same deference very, very soon. For our next story today, cast your mind back to last October and try to remember how things felt regarding the Ukraine war. As you probably recall, fall of 2023 was a bad time for Kyiv. The much-hyped summer offensive had culminated far shorter of even its minimal goals, petering out around the village of Robotyn. In the US, the first rumblings of the drawn-out fight that would keep additional funding locked up in Congress were being felt. On the wider international stage, many of Ukraine's Western backers seemed to be getting cold feet. But then news started to leak through of a daring operation to cross the Dnipro River and establish a bridgehead on the Russian-controlled Eastern Bank. An operation that, against all the odds, appeared to be succeeding. Here's how we described it in our first ever Situation Room. The Russians have air superiority in the sector, and the Ukrainians are fighting with their backs against the river. And we need to stress again just how small these East Bank footholds are. Nonetheless, at the time of recording, they're still there. Possibly the start of something significant. Possibly just another false hope in a war that has already seen hundreds of them. We quote ourselves because we think our take was representative of how most people watching the conflict were feeling. Doubtful that this high-risk operation could achieve its goals, but also unable to extinguish the flicker of hope that it brought. Well, nine months later, uh, the full story of the Crinky Bridgehead is at last in the public sphere. Ukrainian investigative outlet Slidstvo recently splashed with a feature interviewing those who were there. Around the same time, the Kiev Independent released its own report, while analysts from Finland's Black Bird Group have tried to tell the story using open source information. All seem to agree on one major point. Running from mid-October of 2023 to mid-June of 2024, the operation in Krinky was hell on earth. A scaled-down version of the Battle of Bakhmut that killed uncountable Ukrainians and Russians and reduced a settlement to ashes, all while achieving little of strategic significance for either side. In this chapter today, we'll be telling the story as these sources report it, both because it shines an important spotlight on the carnage associated with this war, but also because it highlights damaging mistakes both sides keep making. As Blackbird Group researcher John Helen has written on X, quoting here, In many ways, the battle is the war in miniature. Now, before we get on to that part, though, we first need to quickly set the scene. Because understanding the geography of the area is key to understanding what happens. A former fishing village, Krinky is situated on the east bank of the Dnipro, across the river from the towns and villages that radiate out and away from the city of Hessen. You probably remember that name, the only regional capital the Russians captured during their full-scale invasion. Kherson was liberated in the fall of 2022 by the Ukrainian army. But the very thing that made it hard for Moscow's forces to hold the gigantic river their banks were pinned against also provided a natural barrier after liberation. Ukraine may have retaken the city, but the still occupied parts of Kherson and Blast were now out of reach. Not that the Ukrainians didn't try. In early 2023, Marines began crossing the several kilometer wide river under the cover of darkness to harass Russian positions. But it was only when Moscow's forces began shelling Kherson from across the water that a concrete plan was formed. A plan to cross, in force, push east, and create a buffer zone so wide that the city would be beyond the range of Russia's guns. Compared to the vast summer offensive, the operation would be small potatoes. With 64,000 Russian troops in the sector and a terrain mostly comprised of swamps, only the most hopelessly naive envisioned pushing south from Krinky towards Crimea. But Kiev still intended to commit serious forces to the fight. The Royal United Services Institute, or RUSI, estimates they stockpiled 55 guided multiple launch rocket systems. Elite Marine units were assigned. For a short while in October, it almost seemed to be enough. 
The operation began with multiple targets, not just Krinky, but also the villagers of Pishinivka, Pidstepnia, and Kozhatsky Lahari. Writing in the Finnish daily, Helsingin Sangamat, the Blackbird group suggests, had they succeeded in all places, the bridgehead may have been wide enough to create an actual threat to Russia. According to the IUSI's report, the Ukrainians got closer than Moscow would like to admit. In their telling, a lodgment was secured on the eastern bank that was large enough for significant numbers of troops to have been moved across. For three days, the Ukrainians kept this bridgehead intact. Yet in the end, large numbers of soldiers weren't dispatched across the river. Most probably, this was a good thing. As IOSI writes, quote, While a large body of troops might have been projected over the river, they could not be sustained. And the larger the force, the less visible their sustainment would be. With the window closing and the decision made to forego crossing in force, the most sensible thing to do would probably have been to abandon the operation at this stage, to extract the Marines and write it off as a clever gamble that just didn't pan out. Instead, though, Kiev decided to defend the bridgehead, to keep its lodgment on the eastern bank, even as the chance to make use of it evaporated. Even as the Ukrainians lost control of all their positions, except an envelope about 500 meters deep around Krinky. This was a tough ask. The Kiev Independent reports on soldiers who found it impossible to dig in amid the swampy terrain. The Telegraph notes that those on the eastern bank could only be resupplied by dinghies, and that the only long-range support came from artillery on the western bank. In the major report on the battle, Slitsvo used as their headline the quote, I have seen hell, and the name of it is Krinky. And it's easy to see why. With their backs to the river and a near impossible resupply chain, many of the Marines shipped over there found themselves dropped into a meat grinder. Let's start with the issue of the river itself. A roundhouse in the Dnipro is so wide that crossing it can take between 30 and 60 minutes. That's up to an hour on open water in an area that is saturated with Russian drones. One Marine told the Telegraph it was like, quote, being tossed like a piece of meat to the wolves. With Russia able to see each boat trying to cross the river, doing so became suicidal. And that includes not just resupply boats going west to east, but also attempts to evacuate the wounded back west. In an interview with Slitsvo, one soldier talked about how troops who lost limbs in the fighting were waiting 10 days to be evacuated. While he also said the medic in their group was so good that relatively few died, the numbers tell a different story. As the Russian presence on the East Bank expanded from 64,000 to 120,000, Ukrainian casualties spiked. Slitsvo reports, using figures other sources broadly agree with, that Kiev lost up to a thousand men between October 2023 and June of 2024. The majority, nearly 800, are officially missing, although it's presumed that most of them drowned during dangerous river crossings. 58 pieces of military equipment were also destroyed. Now, to be fair, a thousand dead or missing is not an astrical amount in this bloodiest of wars. Wagner suffered nearly 20,000 killed, just taking Bakhmut, for example. However, those thousand dead Ukrainians were mostly high-value troops, experienced marines rather than volunteer fighters. But perhaps the part that really drove the wave of anger in Ukraine following Slidstrow's report was the feeling that these men died for nothing. In the first couple of months of the Krinky operation, soldiers interviewed by the outlet said that they believed it was still possible to expand the bridgehead and maybe create a buffer zone. By early winter, though, many had come to believe that holding their positions was less about military objectives and more about scoring propaganda points. Here's how the Kiev Independent describes it. Soldiers felt that it was a form of political theater to distract Western allies from the largely failed counteroffensive. This was echoed by outside analysts. Senior fellow at Carnegie Endowment Michael Kaufman is on record in late 2023 as saying, Although one can identify military goals, the operation also appears to have political objectives, giving the sense that Ukrainian forces are still on the offensive. The fear seems to have been that abandoning Krinky following the disappointing summer counteroffensive would convince Western allies that Kiev couldn't win, that the US Congress would use it as an excuse to never pass the frozen supplemental. And hey, maybe this was the right way of looking at it. Maybe Western politicians really are so fickle that they need constant victories to keep their interest. But that doesn't mean defending Krinky made military sense. Nonetheless, Ukrainian high command tried to frame it as a fixing action that would stop Russian troops from redeploying elsewhere while inflicting significant casualties. That anyone bought this is mostly because the Ukrainians really were killing a huge number of Russians. Yeah, while the Krinky operation was arguably a waste of valuable men and resources for Kiev, that doesn't mean it wasn't also a nightmare for Moscow. When it became apparent in the early weeks that Ukraine wasn't going to be able to push deeper inland, the Russians had a choice. They could either aim to contain the Ukrainians around their bridgehead at the cost of handing Kiev a small PR victory, or they could utterly destroy the bridgehead at the cost of losing swaths of their own men. 
And do you care to guess which one of those two options the Kremlin ultimately went for? Although the crossing of the river was suicide for the Ukrainians, approaching Krinky likewise became a death trap for the Russians. Ukrainian drones and their artillery devastated their forces. Here's how analyst John Helen describes it. Russians threw men and material at the bridgehead with no consideration for their survival. In just over four months of fighting, the Russians lost over 200 pieces of heavy equipment. There is no solid data on the total Russian lives lost, but it must have been immense. Unlike in Bakhmut, the Kremlin couldn't even tell itself that it was trading scores of low-value troops for smaller numbers of high-value Ukrainian soldiers. Reporting shows that Russia sent its own elite units into the Krinky Grinder. Finally, after nine months of carnage, the sheer force of Russian manpower proved too much. The Deep State Telegram channel reported on June the 17th that Krinky was overrun, and so ended perhaps the bloodiest battle in Ukraine to receive almost no media attention. Now, curiously, that lack of discussion continued even after the Kremlin's victory. Normally, taking control of even a tiny village sparks a tsunami of celebrations and memes on Russian social media, but Krinky's fall passed with barely a whisper. Helen has suggested that this is because the Russians were embarrassed about the sheer volume of equipment and personnel lost capturing a village they'd already seized twice before. Perhaps, though, another reason why neither Moscow nor Kiev is talking much about this is because the Battle of Krinky was a showcase of the mistakes both sides keep repeating again and again. In a sprawling, complex war, no military is going to get everything perfect. Anyone with even a passing knowledge of history can likely name times the Allies messed up in World War II, for example. But the Ukraine war is a conflict in which both parties seem unable to learn from their screw-ups. We don't mean on a military level. Both Ukraine and Russia are constantly adapting. We mean on a political level. Here, for example, is how the Kiev Independent described the battles for both Krinky and Bakhmut, although it could also describe the fight for Severodonetsk in the summer of 2022. Quoting, While the basic premise of such operations, to inflict casualties on Russian troops, to create a diversion, and to prevent Russian forces from being redirected elsewhere, was acknowledged, Ukrainian military leadership drew criticism for making its forces fight those battles past their point of usefulness. On the Russian side, you have the willingness to sacrifice enormous numbers of lives to make creeping gains. In Bakhmut and during the recent Kharkiv offensive, as in Krinky, Moscow accepted eye-watering casualties for what were, at best, minor victories. Had the Kremlin decided to merely contain the Ukrainian bridgehead, it would have expended far less in terms of manpower and equipment without significantly altering dynamics in the theater. To be clear, our intention in this section hasn't been to do Ukraine down or to suggest its forces give up. Kiev is fighting for its very survival, after all. Rather, our intention has been to use the Krinky experience to show how, as the war drags on, Ukraine needs to desperately change its political culture, to stop turning defensive strongholds of little strategic value into symbolic stands that pull in troops urgently needed elsewhere. Hopefully, this change could be coming. Speaking to New Voice of Ukraine, a member of the Parliamentary Defense Committee, Solomir Bobrovska recently vowed to open an investigation into the Krinky debacle. Already the commander of the operation, General Yuri Sadol, has been fired. But none of this will change the fact that over 1,000 Ukrainian soldiers died for this remote and swampy stretch of riverbank. 1,000 men who leave behind families and friends who must now be wondering what they died for. We can only pray that this time, Ukraine's political leaders finally learn from their mistakes. Next up, we return to the Middle East, where the Israeli city of Tel Aviv has come under attack. Tel Aviv is Israel's economic and financial center, and its largest globally recognized city, layered under the protection of Israel's best air defense systems and a half million strong Israel Defense Force, or IDF. But the attack that rained down on Tel Aviv on Friday, the 19th of July, is important not just because of what the attack achieved, but where it came from. The incident in question took place in the early hours of the morning, when a long-range drone cut eastward toward Tel Aviv from its flight path over the Mediterranean Sea. When it arrived, it didn't trigger Israel's usual air raid alarms, and it wasn't intercepted by any of Israel's interlocking defense systems. Not the Arrow, not David's Sling, not the Patriots, not the Iron Dome, and not even the experimental Iron Beam. It is an apartment building, a block from the sea, in Tel Aviv's beachfront district, not far from the U.S. Embassy. It would kill one person, a 50-year-old Belarusian immigrant to Israel named Yevgeny Ferda, and injure nearly a dozen more. Initially, global onlookers broadly assumed that it may have come by way of the Hamas organization Israel Israel is fighting in the Gaza Strip, but more likely, it came by way of the Hezbollah organization in Lebanon. 
Israel has been fighting a low-grade conflict against Hezbollah for nearly a year and recently killed a senior commander within the organization, suggesting a retaliation attempt that would fit with many prior Hezbollah strikes. But before long, the world had its answer. And the culprit was neither Hamas in the south nor Hezbollah to the north. Instead, the drone had come from the southeast by way of the Houthi rebel organization of Yemen. Now, those among our viewers who've followed the situation room for any length of time know the Houthis well. They're the group launching a relentless barrage of missile and drone attacks against commercial trade and shipping vessels in the Red Sea off of Yemen's coast. They've sunk multiple ships, damaged and captured others, killed civilian sailors, and generally proved themselves a menace that an international coalition of warships and air assets haven't quite figured out how to deal with. But for the Houthis to successfully strike at the heart of Israel is a very new phenomenon. According to the IDF's chief spokesman, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari, the Houthis had flown their drone aircraft from Yemen directly, taking it over the sea in a circuitous route of hundreds upon hundreds of kilometers. A Houthi spokesman confirmed Agari's account, claiming the strike as a Houthi act and vowing that the Houthis would continue to launch such attacks in solidarity with the Hamas organization in Gaza and the Palestinian people there. The Houthi organization, like Hamas, receives major backing from the nation of Iran, and the groups operate toward most of the same broad purposes, although they're not believed to actively coordinate. With the culprit identified, the next question was a pressing one. How did a lone Houthi drone manage to slip past Israeli air defenses? It's not uncommon for drones and missiles to land on Israeli territory. After all, the country's air defenses are quite advanced and feature a targeting system that deprioritizes incoming projectiles that will crash down someplace where nobody is expected to be at risk. But Tel Aviv's waterfront district is not a target that Israeli air defenses should ever allow to be hit, much less by a drone that had been flying for hours, circling off the Israeli coast in a way that almost certainly should have seen it identified and tracked. The drone in question was quickly identified to be a Samad 3, an Iranian-made but Houthi-manufactured long-range drone that can fly about 1,500 kilometers. In this case, the drone flew even further, with Israel noting that it had been re-engineered for better fuel storage. It features an explosive payload, but it's neither particularly small nor particularly fast, flying no quicker than about 250 kilometers an hour, 160 miles per hour. Because of the added fuel, it was likely even slower than that. According to Israel, the problem was one of human error. The drone was identified, but the sirens that would usually signal an incoming projectile to the people of Tel Aviv never went off. Hagari and other IDF officials would later claim that the drone had erroneously been identified as not having been a threat, leading to intercepted projectiles never being launched. That's especially problematic because the drone's flight path took it on a path around much of Israel, meaning that it would have interacted with multiple elements of the country's air defenses and was never correctly ID'd. The drone flew over the Red Sea, over Eritrea, Sudan, and Egypt, and then back out to sea before it hit. But the Houthis offered another explanation, that the drone had been modified to bypass interception systems and was invisible to Israeli radar. Later revelations from within Israel have provided significant, though indirect, support for such an idea. Per some Israeli sources, the drone was tracked intermittently, but the tracking coverage flickered in and out as the drone proceeded along its flight path. Also of note, Israel was tracking a drone approaching simultaneously from the opposite direction, which was shot down by fighter aircraft. It's unclear whether the drone launches were linked. In Israel, the response consisted not just of defensive adjustments, but offensive retaliation. On the home front, Israel quickly doubled its number of radar operators working in the air defense systems and announced an increase in air patrols, putting more warplanes in the sky and thus increasing Israel's capacity for rapid response, even if its air defense assets fall short for a second time. The day after the Tel Aviv strike, Israel launched retaliatory airstrikes with dozens of its own American-made F-15 and F-35 fighter-bomber aircraft streaking over the Houthi-controlled Yemeni port city of Hodeida and dropping heavy ordnance. The Israelis reportedly struck stores of oil and diesel fuel, killing six people and injuring 83 per Yemen's health ministry. They also started a large fire, apparently destroyed a local electric company. Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant proudly claimed the strikes and framed them as a warning and an example, emphasizing that the Houthis had never before harmed an Israeli citizen. Quoting Gallant now, We will do this in any place where it may be required. The blood of Israeli citizens has a price. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu added in separate remarks, quoting here, We will protect ourselves in every way on every front. Anyone who harms us will pay a very heavy price for his aggression. In the days since, the Houthis launched attempts to retaliate in kind, but those were dealt with far more efficiency over Israel than the initial Houthi drone had been. When we consider what the Houthi strike on Tel Aviv means in a broader context, we've got to start with the fact that the Houthi threat to Israel is not new. 
Sanaa has been trying to land hits on Jerusalem since the start of the Israel-Hamas war in solidarity with Hamas and the people of Gaza, but it's usually been unable to reach Israel's southernmost territory with its drones and cruise missiles. Now, it's too soon to say whether the Houthis may be able to hit Israel more consistently, but their failure to replicate and follow up their Tel Aviv strike thus far indicates that the Houthis might have either gotten a lucky hit or exposed a defensive vulnerability that Israel quickly fixed. Yet even though the Houthis may not pose a consistently daunting threat to Israel, they're yet another adversary that demands the IDF's attention. With Hamas to the west, Hezbollah to the north, desperate Iraqi and Syrian militias plus Iran to the east and Hamas to the south, Israel's military and its air defenses in particular are encircled. That's a problem Israel can manage almost indefinitely if none of its adversaries step up their offensive actions in any major way. But if Iran and its regional allies were to ever launch the sort of combined assault that could overwhelm Israeli air defense, perhaps as part of a long-feared Israeli war against Hezbollah, then those same Houthi drones would have an elevated potential to do real damage. In a final note, both the Houthi strike on Tel Aviv and Israel's retaliation shed light on not just the combatants, but the nation caught in the middle. As we've already mentioned today on The Situation Room, Saudi Arabia is a powerhouse in the Middle East, and if Israel and the Houthis want to trade blows, the most direct path to do so involves a flight over hundreds of kilometers of Saudi territory. The Saudis have, thus far, attempted to stay out of the current Middle East conflict, expressing solidarity with the people of Palestine, but working hard to preserve its shot at finally normalizing its diplomatic relations with Israel. But look a bit closer at this most recent exchange, and Saudi Arabia's posture gets a bit more clear. The Houthis, of course, took care to avoid Saudi airspace at all costs. They crossed two seas and three African nations instead, despite the risk of their drone being intercepted by any of those three nations or running out of fuel on its long journey. But according to the Israeli station Army Radio, Israel's warplanes flew over Saudi airspace for most of the flight to Hadida, coordinating with the Saudis in order to do so. Saudi Arabia has since denied any involvement, but no alternative flight paths have been presented. At least in regard to future exchanges between Israel and the Houthis, Saudi Arabia may have just revealed which side it'll be quietly supporting. And finally today, let's turn our attention to Canada. It was the announcement that allies had been waiting to hear. As the NATO summit in Washington drew to a close on July the 11th, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made a pledge that promised to transform the Canadian defense sector. Quoting him, All we can say with confidence and assurance that we will hit the 2% spending mark by 2032. For military hawks, that dry sentence, and said during a news conference, must have sounded like the sweetest music. Since 2014, NATO states have operated under a commitment to spend 2% of GDP on defense annually. Politico reports that this year will see 23 of the alliance's 32 nations hit the target, the highest number yet. For a long time, Ottawa resisted this shift. 2023 saw Canada spend a mere 1.37% of GDP on defense, among the lowest levels in NATO. That same year, The Economist writes, that leaked Pentagon intelligence documents confirmed that Mr. Trudeau had told NATO allies not only that Canada would not reach the 2% commitment in 2023, but that it never would. While 2024 did see the government commit to spending more over the long term, the original plan was to hit 1.7% by the end of the decade. Given that even this was seen as a major shift, it's fair to ask, well, what's changed? According to Politico, a major factor has been increasing pressure from other NATO allies. Behind the scenes, European leaders from the alliance's eastern flank, where defense spending is high, have been leaning on Canada to pull its weight. Both in private and in public, the Americans have likewise been turning the screws. And current NATO head Jen Stoltenberg publicly singled Ottawa out in February, declaring that Europeans and Canada have to spend more because we haven't seen fair burden sharing in the alliance. At least on the surface, the campaign seems to have worked. Trudeau's recent announcement marked a historic shift, coming after decades of sharp underspending. But of course, nothing is ever that simple in politics. While the Trudeau government is now making all the right noises about hitting the 2% threshold, not everyone is convinced. In fact, the unspoken questioning hovering over all of this seems to be, could Ottawa be trusted to actually deliver? Now, in some ways, that framing might be unfair. Canada's government has long had a low opinion of the 2% goal, arguing that it doesn't capture the reality of defense spending. To see what we mean, 
Consider this. On a 2023 chart of NATO nations ranked by spending as a percentage of GDP, Canada would be seventh from the bottom, ahead of only Slovenia, Turkey, Spain, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Iceland. This year, it would likely be even lower, given Turkey's stated aim of boosting spending closer to 4%. Put the chart in actual dollars, though, and Canada leaps up the rankings, no longer seventh from the bottom, but seventh from the top. That's because the Canadian economy is so large that even spending a mere 1.37% means Ottawa is throwing more money at defense than most NATO nations. Ranked this way, Canada would be storming ahead of countries like Estonia, the second highest spender by percentage of GDP, and closing in on the highest percentage spender of all, Poland. For this way of thinking, what matters most of all is the raw dollars. Or as Justin Logan of the Cato Institute put it to PolitiFact in a similar argument over German defense spending, quoting here, 2% of the German economy is more than double the entire Estonian economy. However, while it may be true that Canadian defense spending in actual dollars dwarfs that of most militaries on Earth, that still doesn't mean that Ottawa is spending enough. To see why, all we have to do is look at the state of the country's armed forces. Late last year, a leaked military report painted a fundamentally bleak picture. Here's how Politico summed it up. Canada's military is so underfunded that half of its equipment is considered unavailable and unserviceable. In a recent piece, CBC separately looked at the readiness of Canadian forces deployed to NATO's eastern flank on the border with Russia. They summed up the deficiencies they found this way. The Canadian Army deployed into Eastern Europe without dedicated air and missile defense systems, with no way to counter drone attacks, armed with ancient anti-tank weapons, and a supply of artillery ammunition that would last only a few days in a real fight. And this isn't even to mention Canada's worrying lack of security around its northern coast, at a moment when global warming is opening new shipping lanes and both Russia and China are encroaching on the Arctic. However, it's not just regarding missing and badly maintained equipment where Canada falls behind its peers, but also in lack of investment for the future. Although it's less talked about, the same NATO summit that produced the 2% pledge also produced a pledge for each member to spend 20% of their defense budgets on new equipment. This is a rule the vast majority of alliance members abide by. Politico notes how Poland is buying tanks and fighter planes, Germany is splashing on artillery, and the Baltic states are pooling together to invest in air defense and drone production. But not Canada. Along with Belgium, it is the only nation failing to invest properly in new equipment purchases. Thankfully, this could be about to change. In the run-up to Trudeau's big announcement, Ottawa released plans to buy new submarines and to enter a pact to build icebreakers with America and Finland. Defense Secretary Bill Blair even made some noises about needing to urgently boost Canada's military presence in the Arctic. Yet questions still remain over the administration's willingness to carry through its plans, not least because no money has yet been bookmarked for these projects. Right now, the Trudeau government is deeply unpopular in Canada. How unpopular? Well, according to the Angus Reid Institute, so unpopular that Trudeau's approval rating has hit a mere 28%. By way of comparison, 538's polling average shows that even following his disastrous debate performance, Joe Biden never dipped below 36%. With an election due by October 2025 at the latest, this means there's a very good chance that Trudeau will never have to follow through on his 2% pledge. As the New York Times writes, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's defense pledge will not be binding if he loses to his conservative opponent, Pierre Polivare, who is considered a serious challenger. Unfortunately for those Canadians who support a defense spending hike, Polivare seems to have ruled out sticking to the 2% target. The National Post reports him saying, I make promises that I keep, and right now, we, our country, is broke. I'm inheriting a dumpster fire when it comes to the budget. Now, to be fair, the 2% target is not a legal requirement. NATO states are not treaty-bound to hit it, and as German defense analyst Ulrich Franke has posted on X, it is simply not true that NATO members not reaching it are in any kind of breach of contract. As such, it's entirely up to Polivier or what he spends Canada's money on if he wins the election. And there are signs that voters wouldn't reward him even if he went all in on defense. Speaking to Politico, Barton Chair at Canada's Carleton University, Philippe Legasse, explained how, in regards to hitting NATO commitments, the Canadian public doesn't really see the need. If forced to choose between defense spending, social programs, or reducing taxes, defense would always come last. A lot of this is to do with the culture that hasn't in recent years valued its armed forces highly. It's also due to living next door to the most militarily powerful nation on the planet. As we've said before in other videos, there's no possible real-world scenario where Russia or China attacks Canada and Uncle Sam doesn't come running to help. But that doesn't mean that underspending on defense is a good idea. 
Recently, the country's outgoing top military commander, General Wayne R., made what may become his final major speech before his upcoming retirement. According to CBC, the general noted that Canadians may now be living through a pre-war period, one in which using peacetime processes and mindsets won't work. He also included what may turn out to be a prescient warning, telling his audience that, quote, our military history is one of unpreparedness at the outset of war. 1914, 1939, 1950, 2001 are all stark examples. Let's not let that happen again. Only time will tell if this is a warning that Canada's politicians will be willing to heed.